I'm Nick Pettit. I'm Jason Seifer. And you're watching The Treehouse Show, your weekly dose of internet where we talk about all things web design, web development, and more. In this episode, we'll be talking about 3D scrolling, flexbox, material design, and more. Let's check it out. First up is Space.js. This is HTML-driven narrative 3D scrolling. That's spelled differently than I thought. It is, but uh, I would just call it uh, 3D scrolling because that's that's pretty much what it is. So when I scroll down the page, whoa, what is happening? Is this a web page or are we flying through space? So I'm just going to scroll through really quickly wow. there. Wow! Yeah, I think we are flying I, through. I think you guys, space. you know, probably got all the all the code there, got the idea. Now actually, we're going to go to their GitHub page and learn a little bit more about how this works. So, magic. as you scroll down the page, these frames start moving towards you. So this is a JavaScript library, and once you type out some of this markup and include the JavaScript in your page, you can create these frames. Now, they recommend having this space frame along with this space inner frame to enable vertical and horizontal centering inside each one. So then you can also include some of these options. So you can have custom durations as well as different types of transitions. There it is, entry and exit. So you can have them fade in or fade out or kind of zoom in or move to the left or right, all sorts of stuff. Anyway, uh, there we go. There's all the custom transitions. Pretty cool stuff, so definitely be sure to check this one out if you want to do some uh, some 3D scrolling. You know, sometimes people ask Nick and I where we find all of these great libraries, and we uh, found this out uh, when we were having drinks at the Space Bar. That's where we found out about space.js. That's a complete lie. Get it? Yeah, I get it. Space Bar, like it's a key yeah, on the keyboard, but it also could be the, the name of like right. a... An establishment. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. They next, got it. Next up, we have an article about what nobody will tell you about the will change property in CSS. Except the host of the Trio Show, we're going to tell you. And the blog that we uh, read this from. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, the will change property is supposed to give browsers notice that you will be doing some sort of manipulation to a DOM element and what kind of change is going to happen. Now, the problem with this is that not all browsers support the will change property. And if a browser does not support it, it may not render the element properly. So here's a really simple example. There is two divs with the classes of box, box one and box two. Now, if we look at the styling, uh, this looks pretty good. The box has a width and height of 100 pixels. Uh, box one has a background of orange. Box two has a background of teal. Now, the big difference here, the box one class has this will change property set to transform. And what's going to happen is if a browser does not support the will change property, then the green box will be rendered. And if not, the orange box will be rendered. Now, the problem with this is that if you are going to be testing in multiple browsers, you need to actually make sure that this property renders. There is no real graceful degradation there. Uh, the author of this article says that this brings us back to the old IE6 and 7 days. Anyway, this is just something to keep in mind if you're using the will change property. Maybe wait until it has more browser support. But go ahead and read the article for a little bit more specifics. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is the Flexbox Cheat Sheet Cheat Sheet. Oh, good. So there's lots of cheat sheets out there for Flexbox. But this article is saying that they kept going back to the post on CSS tricks that's all about it, which is a very good post. I've referred to that one a lot myself, so I know exactly what they're talking about. And they said, well, it might be a little bit nicer to actually organize it a bit differently. And they have this little flow chart. So first, they just have the basic concepts of a flex container with some flex items inside of it. So that's the basic setup for a flex box layout. And then you have the cross access and main access, and that's, that's helpful. And then they have this flow chart here. And they say, well, do you want rows or columns? Or first it says to activate the flex box powers, you have to say display flex. So that's 
what you would do on this flex container. Then it says, do you want rows or columns? Well, if you want rows, then you're going to have to say flex direction row or flex direction column. And again, you do that on the container. And then same thing, you can also reverse those if you want to do reversed rows or reversed columns. And then you can add a couple of more properties and values to the container. So it has those. And then down here, let's see, where is it? Yes, on the flex items, there are a couple of things you can do as well. Anyway, I just really liked the formatting of this because it's in this simple sort of question and answer format or flowchart format where you can say like, well, do you want to do this or that, yes or no? And it makes it really easy to figure out which properties that you want to use because Flexbox, of course, is a new method for laying out web pages and it's not perfectly supported in every browser just yet. Support is coming along, but it's still really cool and definitely worth learning about now, but it can be a little bit confusing. So this, this cheat sheet, cheat sheet is pretty helpful. Yeah, I can't wait till it has better browser support. I could hardly contain myself. It'll make things a little bit more flexible. Yeah. Next up, we have a project called Materialize. Now, this is a responsive front-end framework that is based on material design from Google. I know because it says that right on the page here. Now, this gives you a whole bunch of material design components as well as SAS versions with the source SCSS files. Uh, it's very easy to set up. You include the CSS and JavaScript, and then you are good to go. Also, it is supported on NPM and Bower. And then it walks you through how the project is set up. That's cool. Why don't we just look at some demos to see what is actually supported? Now, uh, it gives you a ton of different color palettes here. We can see we've got red, pink, and purple, as well as several different shades of colors, as well as the accents, one through four, darken, whatever. Now, we also have grids and containers. Uh, similar to if you're using Bootstrap or any of the other CSS frameworks, hey, this has a grid too. And it gives you class names for row and columns, supports offsets and everything that you expect from a CSS framework. What's really nice is the different helpers and components here. So cards, here's a, here's a nice card. There are all sorts of design uh, specifications lately where cards are kind of the hot new thing. Hey, you want a CSS framework that supports cards? Boom, here's a card. They got basics ca basic cards, image cards with links. You want cards? Hey, tons of different cards here. Now, not going to walk through everything, but if you do want to see a nice little showcase here of everything that's possible, go ahead and check it out. You can find a link to material materialize.css in the show notes right at the bottom of this video. Very cool stuff. Well, next up is a Living Styled Guide Tools In-Depth Overview. Uh, that's a lot of words, so I should probably explain some of them. Yeah, so we've talked about style guides on the show before. Now, this post is about how to make your style guide sentient and an actual person. That is almost true, except not in the slightest bit. A Living Style Guide is basically a place where you can put all of your different components and colors and buttons and things that you end up creating as you are building out a website and it allows your style guide to be flexible and basically include newer things as you create them. It's basically exactly what I said. Sure. Uh, so this guide is for living style guide tools that allow you to create these living style guides. So this is a big list and Let's just scroll down to one that I really like here. Here we go, Pattern Lab. So Pattern Lab is exactly what you would expect out of a tool like this. It allows you to look at all of the different colors, for example, all of the different fonts that you're using, and it shows you what forms look like in your, in your website, and you can use this sort of navigational structure that they have built out here to click through each one of those things. So you'll go to an HTML page and it will just have like, for example, some forms on it, but it will show you, of course, what those forms look like because your CSS is being applied to them. So 
There's lots of other tools like this. I think there's a few generators and Ruby gems and all sorts of stuff in here. So this is a pretty in-depth guide, but I definitely recommend you check this out because creating a living style guide is, is pretty helpful when you're working on a team of other people and you have to sort of create these things on the fly, but you also want to keep other people informed about the stylistic decisions that you're making. That was kind of like how Bootstrap got started, I believe. Yes, that is true. Mm. Anyway, that's a. <laughs> that's about all we have time for today, Nick. Who are you on Twitter? I am at Nick RP. And I am at Jay Cypher. For more information on anything we talked about, check out the show notes right below this video. Thank you, everybody, for watching, and we'll talk to you next week.